So in my last video, I discussed why the hatred of monocultures is overblown, and as expected, it was a bit controversial. But there was some really great discussion in the comments, and some of it made me realize that I need to elaborate on a couple of things. In particular, I made the claim that monocultures were synonymous with planting, and I think for a lot of people, that just didn't really make any sense. Why can't you just plant a diversity of species? That's a really great question, and for me, I take certain things for granted because of my background and experience, but I can see how a lot of people would look upon a monocultural plantation and think, what a shame, they're just mowing down natural diverse forests to plant their most profitable cash crop trees. And certainly there is an economic component to it, and we'll discuss that later. But there are also very strong silvicultural reasons why you plant monocultures. Namely, if you were to plant diverse species, it just wouldn't work most of the time. That, or it would be entirely pointless. So the first thing we need to remember, and this is basically first principles when it comes to forestry, is that trees are complex, highly adapted organisms. Every individual species is highly adapted to very specific conditions. And these could be conditions of uh, growth, mortality, reproduction, site and soils, uh, sunlight availability, moisture and precipitation regimes, and a lot more. This is what gives most forests natural diversity. If you have a mature forest in a climax stage, that forest can have multiple different conditions on the same site. So for example, the canopy can be receiving full sunlight and the understory can be cool and shady, or there can be low competition in the overstory, it can be low density, but then the understory could be very crowded. And of course, there's any number of ways that the overstory could be disturbed and regenerated. You could have uh, small isolated outbreaks of insects and disease. You could have small uh, wind throw events and so forth. And these are the micro disturbances that are replicated by silvicultural regime regimes such as selection harvest, shelter woods, and so forth. When we implement those specific regimes, we are most of the time creating diverse forests by uh, replicating that multiplicity of conditions that is conducive to the growth of multiple different species. But when we clear cut on a single site, that is not what we are doing. We are replicating a disturbance that is a lot larger and more monolithic. Something like a forest fire or a hurricane or massive insect outbreak, something like that. That is fundamentally the uh, event that a clear cut is replicating. And so on a clear cut, you really just have one single set of conditions. You have probably one soil type. You have the same level of sunlight you have the same precipitation, and if you're planting, and this is very important, you have the same density. So when we're practicing responsible scientific forestry, we're looking to plant species that are most well adapted to that specific site and that specific condition. Realistically, how many species are going to be adapted to that monolithic site and condition? Realistically, probably not many. Now, depending on the geographic location and the specific condition, uh, you might have a few options, but in most places, most of the time, there really aren't going to be many options. In fact, there might only be one in some cases. Let's discuss why. So let's start off with density, which honestly is probably enough to explain most of this phenomenon. When we plant, one of the main objectives is to control the density of the stand from the beginning. Now, a stand naturally is growing somewhere between 5,000 all the way up to 10,000 or even higher uh, stems per acre. When we plant, we're usually planting somewhere around 700 trees per acre, maybe more, maybe less, but right around there. That alone automatically excludes the vast majority of hardwood trees from planting. You don't grow hardwoods in a low density environment. Uh, this is partially because of the quality of trees and I've done an entire video about this, which you can watch here, um, or you can read about it in my book, How to Read Your Forest, which you can get for free in the link in the description and comments below. It's really just about the branchiness of the trees. When trees are grown in low density environments, they're branchier. And for certain species that are sold on the basis of quantity, like softwood trees that are sold for dimensional lumber, the branchiness isn't really a problem. But for hardwood trees, which are sold on the basis of quality, that branchiness is going to destroy their value. So you really want to grow them when they're young in a relatively high density environment, AKA not a plantation. But it's not just about the quality and economic value. Planting hardwoods in a low density environment kind of kneecaps one of their main survival mechanisms. 
A lot of hardwood species are highly sought after browse by hungry cervids like moose, deer, and elk, and a lot of their defense against this is numerical. Take sugar maple, for example. Now, sugar maple is heavily browsed across the entirety of its range by either moose or deer. And sugar maple, as I mentioned in the previous video, is also a highly adept regenerator. It has an over 95% germination success rate. It has this amazing ability to just flood the forest floor with regeneration. And the vast majority of these regenerated stems are not going to make it. They're either going to die off because of a lack of resources like sunlight, or they're going to be eaten. And that's perfectly fine because there's just so many of them that statistically a few of them are going to make it into maturity. And that's really all the species needs. If we were to take sugar maple and plant it in a low density environment, we might be fixing some of those issues, namely the lack of availability of resources, but we're not doing anything about the browse issue. So there's a very high probability that if you're going to establish a plantation like that, uh, the vast majority of those stems in the first 10 years of their life, before they're tall enough to reach above the heads of those roaming cervids, they would be absolutely demolished year after year, and it would absolutely take a toll on, at the very least, their quality and certainly their survival as well. So that alone is going to exclude most of your hardwood species, except for specific exceptions based on the actual objectives. Uh, so for example, you can plant aspen, and aspen is browsed heavily, but it doesn't matter as much because it's very fast growing, so it can get out of that stage sooner, and the quality of the product doesn't matter because it's used for pulp wood. Uh, black walnut. Black walnut is known for being pretty poor quality anyway, so it has an entirely different grading scale than the other species. And yes, I have actually seen a successful sugar maple plantation, but it was planted as a sugar bush, so the quality didn't actually matter. In fact, the bushier the crowns, the better. So that leaves us with our softwoods, which are by far the more popular choice for planting, uh, partially because they tend to grow faster. Um, they're more regularly formed, and they're bought and sold on the basis of quantity, how much volume they actually produce, rather than the quality of the stem. So it's easier to manage and predict uh, the outcome of the plantation. So what I want to do is just go down the list of softwoods in the Northeast to assess their viability for planting. And yes, I know, it's just the Northeast. Uh, it's where I'm from. It's my expertise. This isn't supposed to be exhaustive or universal. It's just to give you an idea of the calculus involved. And keep in mind, the Northeast forests are actually the most diverse forests in the United States. So if we're having a certain issue or we're running against a roadblock in the most diverse forests, imagine what you might find elsewhere. So with that said, we have our spruces, red spruce, white spruce, black spruce. We have balsam fir, white pine, cedar, hemlock, and tamarack. Let's start off with tamarack. Tamarack is a tree that grows right before trees can't grow anymore. It's a bog species. It's found on the worst and wettest of sites. If you're planting on a site that is well suited and fit for tamarack, you shouldn't be planting that site. But it has another issue, and that is very limited economic utility. Now, actually, the former paper industry where I'm from did experiment on a small scale with tamarack plantations on nicer sites because it does have a fairly fast growth rate. Um, but it obviously, this the economics there did not pan out. Next, we have hemlock, and hemlock is a species that occupies nicer sites, but it has much the same problem as tamarack. Very limited economic utility. And also, our forests simply don't have a supply issue with hemlock. There's plenty of mature hemlock around owing to its lack of uh, market utility. Next, we have cedar, and cedar is actually, at least on paper, an amazing candidate for a supplementary species to plant for diversity. And that's because it's a very important winter food source for deer, and it's actually pretty hard to uh, regenerate naturally. And yes, cedar, like tamarack, is a swamp species, but there is quite a bit of cedar that grows in a very limited capacity on more upland sites, so it wouldn't be completely shoehorned to throw in some cedar in a plantation. Unfortunately, then, you run up against the same browse issue you do with a lot of hardwoods. You're taking a highly desirable browse species and planting it in an isolated fashion in low density. So you have to kind of count on an animal not walking by it at any point in the next 10 years. That's not very realistic. And in fact, I have heard anecdotal stories of some people and companies planting a little bit of cedar and just giving up because it kept being demolished by deer. Next, you have white pine. And again, 
theoretically an awesome tree. It has a lot of diverse market utility. Uh, it grows on nice sites. It grows relatively quickly and just all around a great tree. Everyone loves white pine. Unfortunately, white pine has one critical weakness, and that is that it does not grow well in low density environments. And this is actually for two different reasons. First reason is that um, on the market, it is actually graded for quality like some hardwoods. So you have the same issue with branchiness and a degradation of quality from that. The second issue is because of its relationship with a native pest known as the white pine weevil. Now, the weevil feeds on the terminal leader of white pine trees. And when it does this, the terminal leader dies off and it's replaced by a lateral leader, which then becomes a new terminal leader. And it can do this successively year after year, feeding on the terminal leaders, sometimes feeding on multiple terminal leaders the same year, because of course, once the lateral leaders take over, it can have multiple terminal leaders. And the net result of this is a tree that just looks like Medusa's hair. Uh, they kind of resemble a cabbage just because they're a mess of stems. Now, if it were like any other pest, you could just kind of uh, assume a certain amount of damage that you'd have from weevil and call it good and plant it anyway. But unfortunately, what happens is that when a pine tree is grown out in the open, it becomes very vigorous and it develops a very thick stem, thick terminal leader, and that actually attracts these bugs. They love to feed on pine grown out in the open. So if you want to grow a good quality, uh, healthy white pine, you actually want to grow it either in a very high density environment where the terminal leader is a bit restrained or the thickness of the terminal leader is restrained, or you wanna grow it in an understory where there's shade and um, there's actually a restriction to how quickly it can grow. So if you try to plant white pine out in the open like that in a low density environment, uh, the outcome is literally going to be easily 98% of those stems being rendered completely useless. Next, we have balsam fir. And on the surface, maybe that could be a good choice. Uh, has a lot of economic utility, grows relatively quickly, grows on nice sites. But unless you're planting Christmas trees, there is absolutely no reason to plant balsam fir. If you are in balsam fir's native range, you're going to grow balsam fir. Balsam fir is a very good regenerator. It's a prolific seed producer and it's pretty relaxed on its site requirements. So whether you want to or not, if you're planting any sort of clear cut within the core of balsam fir's range, you're gonna be growing it whether you like it or not. You just don't need to plant balsam fir. And in general, balsam fir is an incredibly vulnerable and fragile species. Uh, it's incredibly susceptible to rot. It's vulnerable to spruce budworm and other defoliating pests, and it breaks very easily. So uh, a strong snow and ice storm or windstorm can do a tremendous amount of damage to a stand of balsam fir. So a lot of people in the comments of that monoculture video pointed to the vulnerability of monocultures, and that's not necessarily true. It's highly, highly species dependent. And balsam fir is absolutely one of those species that you would never want to plant in a monoculture. It does, however, tend to grow in natural monocultures, and trust me, that is bad enough. So what does that leave us with? Our spruces. Black spruce, red spruce, and white spruce. I guess there's some diversity there, in a sense. And while these three species have slightly differing attributes, they all perform pretty similarly. They're resistant to rot and insects. Uh, they tend to grow on a variety of sites. They grow fairly quickly and they have a lot of economic utility. They're valuable species, albeit with a low diversity to that utility. They're pretty much exclusively used for the production of dimensional lumber. I should also mention red pine. Yes, there are a lot of small red pine plantations out there, mostly owing to a failed government program, uh, but suffice to say, red pine is a very small component in our natural forests in the Northeast. It grows on sandier soils, and most importantly, it just doesn't have a whole lot of economic utility. Um, so probably not a great candidate for planting. So now I just wanna to touch on the economic angle here. Now, obviously um, I use the word market and economics a lot. And so a lot of you might hear that and think, see, see, it's all just about making money. Uh, no, planting is incredibly expensive and capital intensive. And I've done an entire video analyzing the finances of planting. So you can go and give that a watch if you're interested, but suffice to say, yeah, it's expensive. And if you're the one actually investing in that, it absolutely makes sense to expect an economic return from that investment. Even if you as a landowner have the best silvicultural intention in creating your plantation, if you're doing a little bit of like forest restoration work or you're trying to remedy an issue with invasives or something like that, and you're planting for those reasons, you're still going to want to make a return on that investment. It's just, that's just fair. Does that mean we can't have diverse forests or at the very least that forestry can't produce diverse forests? 
Absolutely not. That's absurd. But it does mean we don't use planting to reach that objective. We use all the other tools we have in our tool belt, such as, like I mentioned, selection harvest, shelter woods, irregular shelter woods, and everything else we can do to try to mimic those small scale disturbances that create diverse forests. Planting is just a tool, that's it. And it has very real limitations. It doesn't make it good or bad, it's just a limited tool. Just like a screwdriver can't be used to pound in a nail. So anyway, yes, I think it's extremely fair to say that planting is synonymous with monoculture. Now, obviously, there's going to be exceptions to that. Um, you can do pretty much anything you want if you're operating on a small scale without any limitations. Certainly, I do stuff like that. There's no problem, and yeah, you can be successful, but we have to kind of think about the scalability aspect here. Second, forestry kind of inherently has a problem with follow-up. Uh, a lot of people will conduct experiments, maybe planting a diversity of species, and then there won't really be proper follow-up or the person who did it never saw the results. Um, so I actually have heard of people conducting experiments and then thinking that, oh, you know, this is great, this is the best forestry, and then 20 years down the line, it turns out that it didn't do so hot. Uh, certainly, I have seen a lot of failed experiments. I've probably made failed experiments, time will tell. Um, so anyway, just if you hear about something happening, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best thing to do or even that it will work in any functional way whatsoever. Also, there is one very important exception to all this that I think is totally legitimate and desirable in terms of planting for diversity, and that would be a practice known as interplanting, which is essentially when you have a forest that has a canopy, but maybe there are gaps in that canopy, and you go in and plant a species that doesn't currently exist on that site. So, for example, a lot of people do this with oak, red oak and white oak uh, for wildlife, and that's totally legitimate. But that's kind of like a niche multi-age management thing that I'd kind of put off in its own category. In any case, I don't mean to discourage anything like that. Uh, there's a lot of nuance here, and I'm just kind of trying to give you a broad idea of some of the thought process. So that's all for now, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And please, if you have any thoughts, let me know in the comments. I'm sure some of you are going to have some. And don't forget, guys, we're currently selling lifetime memberships to Silvicultural, which includes lifetime access to all our software and tools, including our mapping software, our financial analysis tool, our growth analysis tool, our courses, and any future developments that we release, which will include a harvest planning tool, which will be coming out very shortly. So I highly recommend you go and check that out. All right, guys, that's all for now. I'll catch you later.